gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another opportunity that you've given us just to come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse, and we find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 1. I think this is the third video in the series. It is May the 2nd, and so we've entered into an exciting month prophetically, at least uh, as far as our blessed hope is concerned. Maybe the Lord will return here for us in May maybe in July, maybe this year. And so uh, I continue to look up and, and I just, I hope that you do too. But in the meantime, we have a focus and every single verse of scripture tells us what our focus is to be or what, it, what it's to be on. It's not to be on our daily circumstances, our, uh, how to overcome the difficulties in our lives uh, on our own, in our own strength, uh, apart from God, without including God, as we walk along through this life as a believer in Christ, where the, God is working all things together for our good. He's working uh, everything according to his good will and purpose in our lives. He, he, he promises to complete the work that he began in us. He's given us grace. He's given us mercy. He's given us peace. He's given us the ability to love one another, truly love one another. I'm talking about true biblical Christian love and concern and prayer for one another's needs in Christ, in the body of Christ. The fellowship of the Spirit, a fellowship that is grounded in unity of being of like mind of having the same affection the same devotion the same emphasis and that is christ the problem comes in folks whenever we look at the christian life as something other than what it is that our primary focus is to be on sin it's to be on self, the law, the world, our present circumstances, our difficulties, whether we've done things right, whether we've done things wrong, you know, should we do this? Should we do that? If God is truly sovereign, and he is, and he, he controls and he directs every step of it, through our journey through life, then, well, I guess we can just sit back and we can just say, well, you know, God's going to work it all out and we don't have to do anything. We can just sit back and just trust God that he's going to work all things together for the good. And it doesn't matter how, how we live. We have no responsibility whatsoever. Steve, you're one of those, those crazy Calvinists that, that believes that God is in control of everything and you're not responsible for anything. It's just, it is a, it's, it's, it's fate. Okay. It's a, it's a predetermined fate that God has determined for your life. It's fatalistic. It's a fatalistic gospel. It's a gospel. Steve, you're preaching a gospel that, that says that Christ has done it all. We don't have to do anything. We don't have any responsibility toward him, toward one another. He's going to all work it out in the end. It doesn't matter how we live. When we talk about the area of Christian responsibility, we're talking about the, the, the ability to respond, first of all, but, but we're also talking about a responsibility to God concerning the revelation that he's given us. Not a responsibility to God that is based upon non-existent revelation that he hasn't given us. I, I want you to understand that as we begin looking at the, this study in Philippians, this amazing epistle, it is important for us to understand 
that we as believers in Christ have been vested with the finished work of Christ. It is because of what Christ has done that we love one another, not because of something that we've done. It's because of what Christ has done for us, is doing and will do in the future that we have concern for one another and that we pray according to God's will concerning one another. Our relationship with Christ, our day-to-day -day walk, is not dependent upon some particular custom revelation given just particularly to us and us alone, okay? We, collectively, the body of Christ, have been abundantly blessed and graced with an enormous body of truth that, that describes who we are in Christ and how we are to live and how we all are to walk and relate to God according to that revelation that's been given us. What I suggest to you is that we have been vested with the finished work of Christ in our lives. In, in putting that proverbial cart before the horse, it, it, is, it is absolutely mandatory that we not take and put before God's work in our lives a list, a long list of, of qualifications or stipulations or conditions or, or whatever. That, however, we have to act. In, if we act in a certain way, God will act in a certain way. What I'm trying to get you to simply see is that we act a certain way because God has, has, has done a particular work in our lives. It is because God has done so, so worked in our lives, so graced us abundantly, so given us freely, okay, of his grace and his peace that we are able to live our lives in accordance with... Uh, we we're able to walk down the right path in life. None of what we're reading here in the epistle here in Philippians, the talk where Paul talks about the, the unity, the fellowship, the love, the concern, the prayer that we have for one another. Everything is centered around the gospel. If we don't understand the truth of the gospel, I don't hardly see how that we're going to, come to know in our experience and grow ever ever more into those realities which we see scripture presenting to us as as being the christian life it was applied to our lives collectively as a whole every single christian listen to me you have not been forgiven any more or less than any other christian you haven't been graced any more or less than any other christian you haven't been blessed above and beyond any other Christian, any more or any less, okay? We all carry the same message. It is the same message, the same life, the same ministry, the same blessings, the same suffering, the same hardship the same circumstances, the same difficulties. God knows what's best for us in order to take and, and further implement all of that which is true of us. I've said this before, I'll say it again. We live and walk, okay, in accordance with the truth that, that God has given us. And so what we're looking at here is when, when we're looking at the love that Paul talks about in, in our increasing in knowledge, in wisdom, in discernment, and our increasing, growing ever more uh, in love toward one another, all of that, you know, if we look at that as, well, these are, these are instructions for us as Christians that if this is God's expressed desire for us and that if we will somehow conform our lives to what we see written in the text, then, then God will do something really extraordinary on our behalf. He'll, he'll, he'll take and because we've put our best foot forward, he's going to take and he's going to bless us 
abundantly. And if we don't do that, well, then we kind of get left on the outside. And, uh, you know, this is, this is really, he's really just describing here, uh, it, he's drawing a picture of the life of the good Christian, the one who's really uh, deserves because he's worked so hard at it uh, to become like what the text is talking about. I'm trying to get your attention, divert, divert your attention away from that to the reality of the fact that what we're looking at when we read Philippians is we are looking at, there's no question that we're looking at God's desired will for our lives here. But it is, there's, there's a message that's a lot stronger, a lot deeper than that. Beneath the surface of these verses, what we're looking at is we're looking at a passage which describes our lives in Christ as having, we've been vested with the finished work of Christ in our lives. And as a result of that, all of this then is, is we can expect to see this in our lives. We can expect to see our love abound toward one another, our prayer concern toward one another. And that be genuine concern and prayer. Prayer according to God's will for our lives. And as a result of that, there's going to be some trouble. There's going to be some hardship. With the gospel brings along with it its own unique set of trials, temptations, circumstances, hardships. And in many times, they're quite severe. Everything that happened in Paul's life was for the furtherance of the gospel. Every single thing. We can't leave anything out. We can't say, well, you know, a, a lot of what Paul did was God used it for the advancement of the, of the gospel. But a lot of it he didn't because Paul decided to go his own way. And now, well, it's hands off. God is, is no longer working in, in Paul both the will and do according to his good pleasure. Is it so difficult, folks, for you to believe that even through you, God is, so, is such a mighty, powerful, loving, merciful God that he takes and he works through all of your circumstances, no matter what they are, no matter how bad they are, no matter how good they are. If your life is going along well, everything's going well. If, if it's not going well, if it's going along the other way, if it's going down a tragic way, that, that in which you don't even understand how this could be happening to you. Is it hard for you to understand that God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who, who hung the stars in the sky, is it not, is it really all that, is it really that impossible to believe that God can take, really can take and work all things together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose? But, but see, what we do is we look at our lives, we, we, we forget about faith, we don't walk by faith, we walk by sight, we look at our lives and we, and we look at this, whatever's going on in our lives, and, and we evaluate uh, from that, we determine how God is working in our lives. Well, God must not be working in my life the way that I would really like for him to or, or the way that he would like to. He's really not able to because of me. I'm in the way. I'm, I'm a hindrance to God's work in my life. The sin nature, the flesh, the old man is actually a hindrance to God's working in my life. Wow, that, that, that old man must be awful powerful. Dearly beloved, the freedom that you seek, the freedom that you, you would love to know and experience in Christ, the liberty not to go out and sin all you want, you're going to do that anyway. You're already doing that, in fact. Every single one of you are already sinning more than what you want to, or at least I hope that's the case. It's not about that. It's not about... A, 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 a daily evaluation of the old man. I've got to get an old man report on my desk every day 
to see how the old man is, is reacting, responding, to see if, if somehow he's, he's hindering the work of God in my life. Are you kidding me? Folks, that is not how God works. The, your flesh, the, the very thing that you're being delivered from, is not going to become some hindrance to God in His delivering you from that. Well, Steve, what is are you, what are you saying? Are you saying that God isn't concerned about the sin in our lives? Well, I'll tell you how concerned he was about it. He was so concerned about the sin in your life that he crucified you with Christ. He put your old man to death. Crucified with Christ. And you were raised with Christ. You were raised with him to walk in newness of life isn't it interesting that you were raised with Christ to walk in newness of life? And as John says, you have a new, a new man, a new nature, a sinless new nature that cannot sin. There is a part of you, folks, that walks on resurrection ground, that walks as who you are. That, that wakes up every day and says, I am a child of God. I'm going to act like one. I am a saint. He calls me a saint. He separated me. Okay. He, I'm, I'm, I have once by one sacrifice forever. I've been sanctified, set apart for God's use. His love is, is undying. It's never ending. He has nothing, absolutely nothing against me. And he's working all things together for my good. Because I've been called through his word. It was through his word that I was called into fellowship with him. I came to see myself as who I am. I, I don't know how many times I've said that Christians today have an identity crisis of sorts. Okay? I, I want you to just stop and imagine the seriousness of an identity crisis on the part of anything, any creature, okay? If my dog doesn't think it's a dog, if, if, if my chicken thinks it's a duck, okay? If a, if a woman thinks she's a man, I, a man thinks he's a woman. Uh, how difficult should it be for any one of us to approach the Word of God and take at face value what God says about us and say, God, God, the God who did not lie calls me a saint, therefore I must be a saint. He calls me righteous, therefore I must be righteous. He says I love the brethren. If, if I don't love the brethren, I'm not even of his. Oh, but, but I, it didn't seem like I loved the brethren very much today. And that's, that's the path we go down. We, we, we walk by sight, not by faith. We look at our circumstances and we judge, we, we grade ourselves. As to how God views us, accepts us, loves us, based upon our performance. And there's nothing in this text at all that talks about human performance. Nothing at all. Nothing. What it describes is it describes the life. It begins, Philippians chapter 1 begins with the truth, the revelation concerning who we are in Christ. If you slow down and read these verses very slowly, you will find out that you are, you are, you are an amazingly different creature than what most pulpits are saying you are today. How often, folks, just be honest, how often when you step into any church, how often do you hear it talked about that you have become the, the righteousness of God in Christ? That God loves you? 
with an undying love that you are his child, that you've always been his child, that he died in your place, that he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, that he, he started you out on your pathway, your journey through life. He started you out. He set your feet on a path right from the very beginning as the path that he put you on is not some path that leads to some success somewhere down the way. That, were the, that sometime, hopefully, if you just if you work hard enough and if you go long enough and if you strive hard enough, that you're going to somehow achieve that state of excellence that, that God, that we believe, we, we've got to believe that God expects of us. What if, what if we set the runner, the walker, the runner, the worker on the, on the path of success right from the very beginning. How about you hire somebody to do the next time you hire somebody to do a job? Why don't you just really shock them and walk up to them and say, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pay you everything, all of this that, that you're going to charge me for. I'm going to pay you up front. I'm going to give you, I'm full pay. Okay. And then I'm going to turn you loose to do your, to do the work. That, that I'm paying you to do. I'm not going to wait until you're done to pay you. I'm going to pay you right up front. I'm going to give you everything that you possibly need. And we'll see how good a job you do. Well, now that's usually not the customary way people do things. And I understand that there's many reasons, good reasons for not doing that. But I use that as a poor illustration. I've never been known for my illustrations, but I use that as, a, as, as somewhat of an illustration to, to, to try to get the point home to you that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. You're lacking behind, you're coming behind in no grace whatsoever. This is where your feet started in your walk with Christ the first day you came to know Him. It, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing picture, folks, because what it tells you is it tells you that the youngest believer in Christ is just as loved, just as forgiven as the elder in Christ, the one who's been in Christ for 50, 60, 70 years. There's no difference. What, what does the old man have that the young child does not have? It saddens me to see how Christianity has evolved to the point to where that it's just the opposite of that. You know, we, we, we evaluate people. We, we, we evaluate people based on how they look. You know, you don't see me wearing a tie. Ever since I came to know Christ, my, my heart's desire has been to take and lead God's people out of bondage, out of slavery, into the promised land. From chapter 1 in Philippians, right away, they've been trained, their mindset, they've been trained, they've been programmed to believe that what they're looking at is really far beyond their experience. It's, it's, this was Paul. For all, I mean, I mean, let's be honest. This was the Apostle Paul. I mean, and how could you? How could your life possibly match up to his? When when God says that the Apostle Paul, his life is an example to all of those of that who believe, thereafter believe. God didn't love Paul any more than you. He didn't direct Paul's life any more than he does yours. He didn't, he didn't determine, set about a goal to, of, of taking Paul from point A to point B. Uh, and, and with you, just leave it up to you. Step back and just say, well, I'm just going to let, I'm going to let them determine their own fate. Okay. Or, you know, that's what I did with Paul. It really, it really came down to Paul determined his own destiny. Show me one verse in scripture, one. Okay, in any of, of Paul's writings or any writings concerning Paul, where that we get any hint of an idea that that was the case in Paul's life. 
that, that Paul was somehow the master of his own destiny. That somehow he was, his whole interest, his whole desire, his whole longing, his whole purpose in life was to try to attain to some righteous standard that, that he thought that God expected him to attain to. That's not the Apostle Paul of this book. Because of what God did, this is why I do what I do. And you can't place, you can't place a value on that. It's priceless. Contained within the, the very the nature of the gospel itself is the message that God did for us what we could not do. And he will continue working to complete that which in us, which we could not ever do. And yet Christian after Christian after Christian will stand in opposition to that truth. The very opposition that turns out to be the very suffering and the difficulty and the hardship and the trials that's, that Paul clearly revealed is becomes the case in the life of most believers who, who carry forth the gospel if you're wanting to present the gospel the purity of the gospel that the gospel that this is what christ has done not what man must do if that's what you really want to do then you can expect opposition to that and that opposition is going to come in various forms. It, they're from mild to hot. Okay. I, I eat that. Uh, I eat that pecani sauce. You know, you, you get pick up a jar. Some of it's mild. Some of it's medium. Some of it's hot. Persecution, hardship, difficulty, persecution. God can take us into that purposely because He willed it. It's not that we messed things up. It's not that we did something wrong to wind up where we were. But maybe there was someone there, there in, in that situation that God placed us that needed to hear the gospel, one of his people, one of his sheep, and he put us there to do it. And, and we're going to complain about, well, let's, let's, let's weigh all of our hardships and difficulty and persecution against the value of what that truth is going to do in that person's life. How about we do that? No wonder we can go through our lives thanking God in all circumstances, knowing, knowing that he, he never allows anything to touch our life except it be for our ultimate good. No wonder we can do that. Because we see the value in it all. But, but my point is, is, what value is there in glorifying self? In, in what value? Of what value is this whole entire theology that says that man is somehow controlling his own destiny? That he's the captain of, of his salvation. He's the, he's, the, he's the one who determines his fate. Okay? That God has just stepped back hands off. I'm going to leave him alone. Let him go his own way. If he messes up, I'll help him. If he don't appreciate what I'm doing, I'll step back even further. I don't think any one of us have a clue as to just how intimately and how personally God is involved in every single minute detail of our lives in ways that we can't even comprehend or imagine. You know, why am I, why am I here? Why am I in, in this job, in this marriage, this relationship? Why am, I, why am I doing what I'm doing right now or not doing what I'm doing right now? I'd like to be doing this, but I'm, 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 I find myself having to do this. Our whole purpose in life 
is to come to realize in our experience, sometimes it takes years, what is already true of us in Christ. It always has been from the very beginning. If, if a babe in Christ only knew just how blessed he is. Most babes in Christ don't, don't realize that at all. And babyhood is, is good while it lasts. We want to grow into adulthood. We want to grow into maturity. But how do we do that? And modern Christianity says unless you do A, B, C, D, and E, you, you can't. Okay? Okay. What I would, what I would, my answer back to, to modern Christianity is, is that this is how I started out. All I'm doing is growing in a greater knowledge and understanding of who I truly already am in Christ. And that is what we're seeing in Philippians chapter one. Not suffer from that identity crisis so that we can continue to grow in knowledge and all discernment. Whether we increase in love toward one another, how could we not? To whether we find ourselves in situations that God has placed us purposely. It may not be, seem very pleasant at the time, but it's God has absolutely has our best in mind. I messed this up. Okay. Well, perhaps that's true to some extent. Perhaps you did, but, but if you're a child of God, you have the Word of God declaring that you're right where God wants you to be. That's, that's sometimes a hard thing to accept. You mean, Lord, I'm in prison because you want me there? I'm alone, living alone, divorced because you want me here? You say this is the best, your best for me? And my question would be, was, is how much do we trust him during those times? Because that, that's what makes all the difference in the world. And it's, oh God, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? I must have done something. Had to have been, I didn't do something right. It's a... It's a, it's a cause and it's a, it's the wrong theology. It's, it's, a, it's this cause and effect sort of, you know, deal between you and God where that, you know, you, you can actually determine what God does in your life by what you do. Seems just the opposite of what it really is. I want to take a moment to thank you all for all of your love, prayers, and support, especially the direct, for the direction of this ministry which in which all the rest hinges upon that. I love you all. I truly do. And I love your comments and your messages. Uh, stay focused on Him. Set your affections on things above, not on things below, where your life is hid with Christ in God. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.